thank you for joining us uh, today. We have uh, two gentlemen who, uh, you know, very good friends with uh, addicts uh, and ourselves and the team here. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Damien. Damien is the CEO of Matrix Ford Asset Management in Singapore. Damien started his career in JP Morgan, where he traded currency options and micro markets for over 15 years uh, across the world. Um, he's currently the trading director of Bitcom, the second largest cryptocurrency options exchange in the world, as well as the CEO of Matrix Ports uh, Asset Management uh, Singapore Arm. Um, we also have CJ. CJ is a business development director with uh, GSR. Uh, GSR is a global leader in crypto trading and market making. And uh, CJ has been with Morgan Stanley for many, many years as a structurer in the fixed income division. Um, and, you know, very happy for him to be joining us as well. So uh, today we have Damien giving us a quick overview uh, presentation uh, just to set the stage here for all of us who are interested in listening and learning about cryptocurrencies. And then we're very happy to have both gentlemen sit with us in a panel. I have some questions. I'm a bit of a noob in the crypto space, but I'm sure many of you will have many questions uh, for these two gentlemen. Um, next slide, Alex. Just And just before we start, um, I'm told we need to give a five minute intro because I think many of you are less familiar with Edex. Um, Edex was started about three years ago. We got a license from MAS uh, last year. Um, really to facilitate private markets investing for everyone. And so, you know, we worked with directly with accredited investors as well as banks, external asset managers and uh, other security houses. And what we do is try to make possible investments into, for example, unicorns, hedge funds, uh, real estate funds. We have a China VC fund, for example, uh, and, and some credit uh, opportunities as well. Um, you will see that we are really taking private markets investing to a very, very simple uh, level. And we think, you know, to make it available for everyone. What we do on our platform uh, is, you know, the ability of our platform to fractionalize investing. And so traditionally hedge funds were at least minimum a, a million wholesale bonds were at 250,000 or 200,000. Uh, we can take that down to uh, 10,000 at the subscription level and at the trading level even lower than that. Um, we have a marketplace. Um, we allow users and, and our investors to buy and sell on our platform. Uh, whereas traditionally you would have to either be locked up for a few years or to wait for the fund to be invested over a course of five to 10 years. So. What that means is not only do we, can we look at traditional alternative assets, which is now called traditional, you know, private equity funds or VC funds. Uh, it also means that it could open uh, potentially the window into, uh, you know, a, a convergence between what's happening in the crypto market and uh, the traditional structures that we're more familiar with uh, and to offer that to uh, investors uh, like yourselves. Next slide, please. So just some examples of the more traditional uh, uh, things we've done. Uh, we've have two private real estate funds, Elite Logistics Fund, which is in Europe Logistics, uh, Maple Tree uh, Europe Fund, which is a commercial uh, portfolio that Maple Tree is managing. We have a China VC fund, UNT, that invests in enterprise uh, tech in China. Um, we also have a fund that invests in unicorn secondaries. We have the more traditional stuff like Astria. Some of you will know it's a portfolio of uh, uh, private equity stakes uh, backed bonds. Um, we also have a, a, a commercial paper from CGS, CIMB, uh, really as an alternative to fixed deposits. So some great, uh, some great investments we have on Addix. Uh, next slide, please. Um, please feel free to download the app. Uh, it's a, we've just launched the app a week ago, so this is all fresh off the, the press. Um, it will make things very simple, our onboarding, subscription, uh, all done sort of within clicks within uh, on your mobile phone. So uh, ad is over. Again, we expect a lot of questions, please. I mean, we have two experts in this field and would really love for you to um, give a, uh, send us your questions and we can uh, take that uh, at the end when we uh, start the panel. So, Damien, over to you. Thanks, Hoi, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining uh, this webinar. And appreciate Adex for hosting it. Uh, I actually did see in the polls that a lot of you are actually all hands in this. About 20% uh, have more than five years of experience in this. So 
I'll probably try to be brief with my uh, presentation because it was uh, really catered more to people who are very new to this uh, crypto investing overall. So disclaimer and then next slide, please. So a brief history of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin is what really kicked it off. It started in January 2009 by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym. Uh, it re really launched Bitcoin and it was fairly stable and it didn't have much traction till much, much later, uh, till really the last few years or so. And that's when, you know, there was much more broader participation in it and overall as well, some institutional adoption and interest in it. And that's when it really started to take off as we saw in the late 2020s and uh, this year. On the back of that, Ethereum, uh, we noticed, uh, previous slide, yeah. We noticed that Ethereum had like, uh, it was on the back of Bitcoin and we noticed that there was not much utility that can be done on Bitcoin itself. So Vitaly, Vitalik Buterin, like at a very young age, you know, recognized that and embedded smart contracts into Ethereum. And that's really what's really driving a lot of like the decentralized finance and a lot of the interesting use cases that we'll go through a little bit later. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is a really like a general graph of uh, Bitcoin over the years. You can see that uh, it's split up into two graphs because that's uh, when you really get an appreciation of the peaks and troughs of the asset itself. Uh, at, at the start, you know, it was fairly quiet in terms of like overall price. And then it really started to take off in October, 2020. Uh, even though there were a lot of events in, in the meantime, you know, like hacks, closures, and like uh, regulatory announcements, uh, it managed to survive and even thrive. Uh, next slide, please. So obviously there's a lot of uh, reasons why crypto, I think is a good investment and a good asset class to at least put a part of your money in. Uh, but I've distilled it into three things that I really think are like the major things, at least for me. Uh, the network effect of it in the sense that anything that has a store of value is only because uh, there is a majority or a large group of people who think that there is value in it. Uh, if, you, if you take a step back and look at gold itself, uh, there's no real reason why gold is a store of value. You could argue that there it is uh, some industrial applications, but if you actually drill down into it, it's only 10 to 15% of the overall gold market. A lot of it is just because everybody else recognizes it's a store of value and that's why it's valuable. So the network effect as more and more people start believing, believing in uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, and the rest of the alternative coins, it's also gonna increase in value and start being recognized as one. Uh, this, compared to gold, it's a lot easier to move your money in Bitcoin and in the overall in blockchain as well. Uh, it's, it's easier to fractionalize it as well. You know, you, there's no way for you to scrape off uh, bits of your gold bar, you know, to make payments overall. And you don't need to uh, actually go through a financial intermediary for a lot of your transactions, which is good. You can do it 24 seven whenever you want and you can self custodize a lot of your assets overall as well. Uh, not so much for Bitcoin, but for Ethereum and the rest of the altcoins, you're starting to see a lot of utility that's uh, being embedded into blockchain. And what we've seen, you know, with DeFi is really just the tip of the iceberg. You know, as people start to figure out how to use this technology, you know, for their specific industry, I think it will be, uh, you'll see that the use cases become a lot more apparent. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you, you know, approach this uh, really volatile asset class? Uh, I, I think uh, you have to approach it slightly different to traditional assets. Uh, there's a long-term buy and hold because uh, if you're a strong believer and you're highly convicted that a lot of what its promises will be fulfilled in the terms of it being a medium of transfer or if there's a store of value, then just buy, uh, put uh, right size your position put a fraction of your portfolio in it and just uh, block out all the news and uh, all the fear and uncertainty that, you know, that's coming out through the media and just uh, be stay convicted in your own fundamentals. And you can uh, put it in a hard wallet so you don't need to rely on any specific person overall as well. Uh, you could actively trade it if you're a bit more sophisticated and have engaged in markets overall. 
just like any traditional uh, market, you know, there are futures, there are derivatives on it. Uh, personally, for example, you can look at selling options to do a little bit more view enhancement strategies. You can do that on bit.com. Uh, you could sell the futures versus buy a holding spot. Uh, that would reduce the directionality of your portfolio, but you could actually get sizable like uh, yield pickup uh, doing that. Or you could even short, short it uh, momentarily or like uh, in, in bear markets because you can actually uh, do that through futures and rather than having to do it uh, in a cumbersome way by borrowing Bitcoin and actually selling it. Uh, you could also participate in DeFi and uh, I talk about a bit more of it in the next slide. So we'll just move on to the next slide here. So everybody's been talking about decentralized finance and a lot of it actually uh, started like a few years ago in like 2017, but uh, started to gain a little bit more traction Right now, uh, a lot of the funding for a lot of these projects were uh, raised a few years ago, but now it's really, we're starting to see the fruits of those uh, uh, capital inputs. Uh, how you can think of it is really, I wouldn't say a replacement, but a complementary way of like working with traditional financial institutions. It's basically using smart contracts for as a trustless way to, re, re, to substitute or replace some of the services that uh, what financial institutions do right now. A very interesting and uh, easy to understand one would, would be just decentralized lending and borrowing. You have a smart contract, uh, you can see the code of actually how it's dispersing the money or like having the money put into it. You can see how the interest rates are set you can put your money into it or you can borrow it and you can uh, earn and not have to face a specific counterparty. You're actually facing the smart contract itself. So it's, uh, it's trustless. You can, uh, self, you can verify it for yourself because it's, uh, the code is just there and uh, you can take out your money whenever you want because it's 24 seven and it's just a smart contract as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the very bubbly and uh, buzz, uh, buzz thing right now. It's uh, NFTs, which uh, it's non-fungible tokens. And, and what has been taking the media attention right now is the NFTs uh, with specific uh, relevance to art. Uh, as we all know, like Meta Coven bought that uh, artwork for $69 million. I have a, actually an interesting story about that. A uh, friend from Cumberland interviewed him and there's an hour long interview of that on YouTube. You can go check it out. And he really goes through his journey and why he actually did it that way. Uh, so you might want to check it out as well. Uh, what's good about it is that, you know, you can embed some, uh, a little bit more interesting things that you can't really do with physical tangible objects. For example, if an artist creates a work, every time it changes hands, you can embed it in their code that the artist gets a small cut of the transaction that actually goes through. So, you know, the artist uh, continues to enjoy and reap the rewards of what it actually initially created. But note that it's not only specific to uh, artwork, you can have it for music, and then you can think about, see how like royalty can be dispersed to anybody who owns a fractional part of it. It can be done for real life, uh, things like real estate and things like that. As long as it's uh, you have the NFT, you know you uh, you you everybody acknowledges you own that specific uh, thing, whatever whatever it may be or asset. Next slide, please. So what's the future of uh, crypto? I think you know as more people realize that it's a uh, it's a real store of value, uh, it's gonna take a fraction of like uh, the market cap of gold and also a fraction of the people's portfolio that they've uh, attributed to their store of value aspect of it. It's also a very good inflation hedge. It's a hard coded, uh, at least for Bitcoin, maybe not for the other coins, uh, that there's a specific amount, number of coins that will ever be minted in, in the life of this whole uh, coin. So uh, against this ma macro backdrop of where a lot of like the central banks are, uh, uh, priming the fiscal pump, you know, it, it might be worth you know, considering like a crypto for, from an inflation hedge point of view. Derivative, derivatives really started to take off, especially options last year. Uh, the, with the growth of the volume there, you know, it becomes a lot more flexible and you start to see that uh, being one of the tools or reasons 
why institutionals are starting to come uh, into this space because they have the tools and the ability to short or right size their portfolio or even uh, like uh, put on the exact exposure that they want to in terms of participation overall. Uh, D5, we've talked about that, you know, and uh, it's only really budding right now. We we're starting to see more and more use, use cases and uh, different aspects of the what banks and asset management firms used to do uh, start being put on smart contracts as well. What people also don't under uh, don't really realize maybe that much is the ubiquity that uh, crypto allows uh, people uh, allows the world to have. What I mean by that is anybody that has a computing platform, it could be a phone, uh, a tablet, or even like a desktop. Uh, it, they don't need to have to wait uh, to be acknowledged by any like an institution if they want to. Uh, have the, if they have $100 and they need to put it in a bank or put it somewhere uh, to, for it to grow, you know, they can participate in a smart contract. They can take it out whenever they want. You know, all the underbanked people in the less developed countries will be able to participate in it. So it's quite uh, democratized in that sense, you know, uh, access to services that uh, other people don't really have right now because it's all governed by uh, bigger institutions. Next slide, please. Uh, there's obviously challenges. That's why it's still so volatile overall. Uh, regulation, I think, is actually a, a challenge, not a risk, because as you start, uh, if any of the governments or if all the governments want to start uh, regulating it, it, then people know the exact treatment of it and how to go about uh, doing it correctly. And we're starting to see uh, that happening. So. I think you know while you might see small drops or like uh, drops when news of this comes out, it's actually long-term bullish because uh, there's less uh, less uh, there's less risk that it, it just disappears you know and it starts getting banned. What would be scary if it is if everybody bans it, but if they're regulating it, it's totally fine. Security-wise, I think if you're not very technically savvy. Uh, it might be a bit tough to uh, like uh, navigate some of the security steps that you need to take. It's still very secure, but it's just very hard to implement it. But I think as more and more firms come into the space and like uh, make it much, much easier for the, for the technically challenged to actually participate in it, then uh, that will go away overall as well. Uh, with smart contracts as well, you know, with more, more eyes looking at it given it's open source, uh, it'll be easier to like uh, look at bugs and uh, like read them out before like actually hackers take advantage of it as well. Uh, tax treatment is different across uh, different like uh, tax regimes, but you know, just like regulation, as we start to see more certainty about it, uh, then we'll also people will be able to be comfortable investing in it overall. In terms of the volatility, though, I don't think that's going away, uh, but that's just uh, comes part and parcel with the space of something where it's going to be very revolutionary and there's going to be a lot of smart people on both sides of it, where some people think, you know, it, it doesn't ha ha have a space anywhere and some people thinking that it's the ne next best thing. So the volatility is not going to go away. It's really more of just where you stand in that debate. And then doing your own research to, and being comfortable with it and right sizing your position so that you don't need to look at it every day and uh, not get stopped out because you're putting things on margin overall. Next slide, please. Uh, over back to or then uh, back to the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Damon, for that. I think that was a great uh, precursor to what I think will be a very lively q and I'm, I'm seeing the questions come in already. All right, let's get on with the uh, Q&A. Now, uh, I always obviously have the, the benefit of asking my questions first. Um, and uh, I'd like to start off by uh, asking uh, CJ and then Damien, so CJ to start. Look, I mean, I've always been asked myself, you know, jumping from a traditional bank to a fintech, you know, why did I do it, my motivations, etc. And, and, and what do I sort of how did I feel about moving from a traditional finance into fintech. So my question to you, both of you are obviously very uh, careered, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. 
And you definitely, you know, where I did the tour in the water with FinTech, I think the two of you sort of jumped right into like off a cliff into the deep end, right? Um, so maybe just some reflections and, and, you know, some observations as to where do you see, I mean, what, what fascinated you about crypto and, and why you're, you're here where you are uh, and what, what excites you about the market? CJ, why don't you go first? Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Wei. Uh, I mean, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think the way we look at it is this, right? Crypto in itself is, can be construed as an asset class. And I think that's what makes it different. That's what sets it apart. Uh, when you start off your career back in the early 2000s, for instance, uh, everyone was talking about stocks, bonds, FX. I mean, those were the things to look at, right? But as the generation rolls into the next generation, you start then to wonder for the current batch of 20s to mid 30s, what do you look at? And I think crypto digital assets was something that came across very strongly. I mean, it was part of the boom. The, the biggest story around is the guy who bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins back in the day, right? Uh, this sort of shows you the absurdity within this market. But it's an interesting market because if you look at how this market has evolved, there needs to be a balance and there is space and room for participants who come from that traditional background, who want to bring best practices into this market. And I think that was what was attractive. And I think that's something that we do very strongly. And I think it's the right way forward for this market as well. Great, Damien? Uh, so for me, I was actually plateauing in uh, JP Morgan overall and uh, in traditional finance in general. Uh, I did computer science uh, in undergraduate and I always wanted to go a little bit back to my tech roots. Uh, I started like having a little bit more time to actually look at uh, the underlying uh, technology and realized that cryptocurrency was a lot more than just Bitcoin itself. And uh, I started exploring all the different technical aspects of it the decentralized finance, and I, I found it quite exciting as well overall. Uh, volumes and options overall, which is obviously my bread and butter and my background, uh, was starting to kick off in 2020 in a big way. So when Matrixport uh, approached me to say that, hey, we're really building out a bit.com uh, volumes and options, would you like to be part of that? And also, you know, some of, your, uh, some of the asset management aspect, aspects of it, uh, would you like to take care of that? Uh, I definitely said yes. I think that a lot of what I've learned in banks overall, uh, the good ways to safeguard assets, uh, how to look at the risk, and also some of the derivatives. It's very similar way of trading and just bringing it into a space where there's not as many participants with that kind of institutional knowledge. So it should be hopefully a little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when I when I meet uh, folks like the two of you, I mean, I get so excited. I think that where I was a skeptic, I was a crypto skeptic, you know, not more than one year ago. I see the talent pool that's moving from traditional finance into crypto. And you kind of think there's so much weight of the capital and the talent that's moving there that, it, you know, it, it, it will drive itself. So that's super exciting to me. Now, the, the, the second thing, that's the same observation that's quite interesting is also obviously in the last few months, uh, where some of the traditional banks, I mean, your old firms, JP Morgan, my old firm, UBS, uh, Morgan Stanley, are all starting to open up their thinking around crypto investments for their own clients. I mean, how, how do the both of you feel about that? I mean, it's kind of, you kind of left and then they're now sort of starting. Uh, do you think they'll be very, they're still very slow to the game and they're just looking very traditional stuff and that, you know, there's more to go or what, what, what's, the, what's the view? I think, uh, I mean, just to take this one first quickly, I, I think it's coming, right? Uh, Goldman did it. They started it back in 2017 and then they stopped it and now they're resuming it. Uh, it is a natural progression. And the reason why is everybody follows hype. Everybody follows news, right? And th this is on the front page, be it for the 40% drops, be it for the 50% rises, it's there. And I think it's in our faces and it's something that if you don't get on that bandwagon, you get left behind. Now, the fact of the matter is, I think with things like futures coming out there uh, on the CME, it lends weight, it lends credibility. One of the first to move forward with this was MicroStrategy who, who gave literally face to it, right? And for GSR and where we sit in this, we are seeing more and more conventional, not just the banks, but family offices have started a long time ago. Corporates are now looking in this space. And as a portfolio diversification play, it gives you something that you never had before. Because historically speaking, that alternative assets bucket tended to be illiquid assets 
tended to be assets where you had to leverage up or there were long lockup periods, for instance. And suddenly you have this new asset class that isn't. And I think a lot of investors find that interesting. There are banks, I mean, the first stage for a lot of forays for banks has actually been custodianship. So you have things like Zodiac Custodia by uh, Standard Chartered. You have guys looking at this space and I think it's just gonna continue to grow. I think they will move in a typical traditional bank way, but they bring with them the expertise, the different stacks, technology, compliance, legal, and that will pull them forward. Uh, there will be a room, for, there will be room for them. That's just the way to look at it, I think. Yeah, I think uh, from my side, the yes, banks are a little bit late to the game, but uh, with their resources uh, uh, at their backs, I think they can come in pretty fast. Uh, they'll have to, it's also a bit of like a frenemy in the sense that there will be now a lot more keen competition for what was usually their uh, their background. For example, like the simple uh, gathering of assets and lending it out. So they have to think of like a very different ways of like revenue and like uh, offering like much more competitive like services in terms of like uh, transfers of money and things like that, uh, where they could. Uh, still be very relevant would be, for example, you know, having to do some due diligence on like some specific NFTs, you know, having the investor base, you know, doing the research uh, that, because right now I think uh, personally, when I've just come into crypto, the finding information that is trusted or very well thought out is very far and few between. So if uh, I could get a little bit more trusted information from uh, some people who I trust and ana like they analyze it well, you know, I think uh, that that could be a space that they inhabit quite well, that is not covered by anyone right now. Okay, well, uh, let's move on to the questions from the audience. There, there's a whole bunch of them. There are a few, um, actually, uh, around how do you value crypto? I'll let Damien go first at that one because he, he brought up a bit in his presentation and I'll, I'll add my thoughts <laughs> after that. Uh, well, I think, well, you, you kind of have to think of it uh, in different ways. It's what, what, one thing I can, uh, how I look at it from a very, very broad perspective is like, what is the, like if, if you ask people, what is the market cap of Apple, for example, and uh, a lot of people don't know. And if you ask them, what is the market cap of Bitcoin? And a lot of people think that uh, Bitcoin is much, much more than Apple, but it's actually much, much less than Apple. So it's in, in terms of like it having broad based participation, it's not there at all. So uh, my thought process is that if you think, you know, uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically is going to get at least some fraction, it doesn't need to dominate the world. Uh, and where its market cap is right now, uh, then you know there's definitely a lot more, a lot, a lot more room for it to 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 rally from here. Whether it's uh, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, I don't think I have that like uh, like level of granularity that I can finesse it. Uh, another thing I look at, for example, also is a market cap for gold. And that's all, like almost like 10 times more than where Bitcoin is. So even if you take a fraction of that, uh, that's another like very strong bullish case, which, which doesn't really involve all like the uh, crazy back and forth daily right now. Over to you, Steve. I mean, just, just to add on, right? Uh, valuation of crypto. Uh, there's two ways you look at it. The, there's valuation of the coins, and then there's valuation of Bitcoin, the core. Uh, I think the coins is interesting. There's a few ways in the market that they look at value. Fundamentally speaking, a lot of people are now gravitating towards market cap comparisons. So how they do that is they look for something very, it's a bit like how we would do credit, right? Uh, how do you value a CDS spread? You look at comparable credits. They do the same thing. They look at, oh, this guy's market cap is here. This is the development stage. This is roughly where it is, a multiple concept. Uh, I think that that's one way you can do it, but that's a bit dangerous as well. And I think it boils down to very similar to an analogy concept. Uh, what is the actual value of gold? Well, the value of gold is the last traded price simple concept. Uh, there is no intrinsic value. You can't discount cash flows for gold per se. You are looking at it as where did it last trade? The interesting thing about crypto is you are able to find this as well. Uh, there are so many, I will call them decentralized pools of liquidity, but it is possible to find a price. And the introduction of something like DeFi and decentralized exchanges has made it even easier for even coins that are not on centralized venues to have price discovery. 
So I guess the right way of looking at it, I mean, there will be people to tell you as well, you can value it by the ecosystem, the network effect, by velocity of the underlying tokens. But you have to be, uh, approach it with a bit of caution, right? This is people trying to assign a value via methods to give them an understanding. I mean, as humans, we want control over something. We want that box, so to speak. So I think that the way to value crypto is probably to look at it holistically. There's a few things, right? Looking at how many people are involved. Where did it last trade? Did that make sense? Where do I see it from here? Is there hype? What's the roadmap of a project, for instance? Who's getting into it? So that's probably the better approach to take, I would say. Yes, I think uh, that that's uh, you know been a few questions uh, from our audience. the The second uh, question that has popped up quite a few times is Bitcoin versus Ethereum. There's gonna, everyone is looking for that flip, right? That flip where Ethereum suddenly has a greater market cap than uh, Bitcoin. I think the two are different. That's the way to look at it. And I think Damien touched on it really well in his presentation. Bitcoin fundamentally, where it stands right now, it is a store of, and the perception is a store of value. Where it has interest right now is it has acceptance, not just in crypto, but by the traditional community. There's futures, it's trading, corporates are looking at it, funds are looking at it. And the first foray is normally Bitcoin. Now, that's an interesting angle because if you were to look across the crypto sphere at other coins, there probably is nothing else that comes close to saying it's a store of value. Now, Ethereum is different. It's what we call a layer one protocol, right? It is something where I provide a platform for you to build on, dApps. Now, it has massive traction because of DeFi. However, having said that, I think it does, in the rear view mirror, have to look out for other layer one protocols, which are coming up bit by bit with their mainnet launches. So that's something to say there. Uh, I'm not going to give you a number. That's the most dangerous thing to do in crypto. I know everybody wants to know what's your price target. Uh, I will leave that to the banks and their research reports. Yeah, I think it's uh, just like CJ said, you know, it's, uh, it's two different things. One's a store of value, one's really like uh, the very hackneyed like comparison is always digital gold versus digital oil. And I think that there is a very big first mover advantage uh, for Bitcoin in the sense that is it the best technology? Is it the most sophisticated? Absolutely not. But the market cap in, its, in of itself and the uh, overall uh acceptance of it and people building things around it like just because it has large market cap it means that people can invest in it you know and not move the market that much and they're like and it, it there's a snowball effect on the back of that there's derivatives that are built on the back of that because you know of the market cap again uh it's not always the best technology that wins in the end like uh for the people old enough to know you know vhs versus betamax or like uh, even some of like the, the Walkman versus like the, the, CD, the CD players and things like that. So uh, it's just building upon itself. And even though like, you know, I, I think that's the wrong question in the sense that uh, both, both can rally, you know, significantly, you know, it doesn't matter whether Ethereum like uh, eclipses the Bitcoin or not, you know, the, the rising tide is going to lift all the boats. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what I, I didn't have time to mention in my little advertisement up front is um, Addix is built on uh, Ethereum uh, on, on, on a private permission blockchain, but we do use Ethereum. And we do see, obviously, the, the future that smart contracts and, and Ethereum has to play. So both very different discussions between Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, this one is a, a more interesting question. It's going to challenge the both of you. Under what, so I, Damien, you know, you, you, you said the word 100,000. So here you go. Under what circumstances will BTC be over 100K and uh, Ethereum over 10K? I'll let Damien uh, do it first. Yeah, since it's yeah. my fault. Uh, yeah, I, I also wanted to uh, set a number. So uh, I will be the first one. I think uh, for me personally, I think if we start to see a uh, very clear regulatory, like uh, like a plan, a roadmap uh, in Europe, the US and China, like, you know, if China says that they either are gonna ban it or like these are like the, the acceptable use cases, then the certainty is there. There's no like, uh, no more is there the black swan that you know, all the governments you know, decide to ban it at the same time. Uh, and there is a space that it can inhabit. 
once that is gone, I think that's the final, like, uh, like final black swan that people are waiting for, or worried about, you know, that uh, has stopped a lot of people from jumping in because it's uh, there's uncertainty in terms of re regulation and tax. So if all of that goes away, initially there'll be a small drop. But I think you know that that's very long term bullish overall, and that's probably what what will like drive it to those levels. Uh, I'm going to go the more pop culture route and say, as long as Elon tweets, it's going to go there. No, I'm just kidding. I think, I think that, that that's, that's the issue we've, we've witnessed over the last couple of weeks, to be fair. Uh, I think calling for a number, and 100K, to be honest, if you compare it to the numbers floating around the street, it's not very high. Uh, truth of the matter is. Uh, I am in full agreement with Damien when it comes to regulation. I, I think there is a need for it. And I think the regulation that should be adopted or perceived as it should be constructive. Uh, the fact is, there is acceptance by the regulators that this is there, right? I mean, you're not seeing, for instance, the US coming out and saying, we will ban crypto, we'll ban Bitcoin. What they're saying is, okay, how do we tax it? So this means that they are taking a more constructive approach. And I think this is really important because once we have some clarity, this is where I will go a slightly different route. What I think is this, once we have clarity there, I think traditional investors have confidence in that. They will be the next wave, especially for Bitcoin. And the reason is this, Typical crypto investor, so old school guys who, for the lack of a better term, they call it HODL, so H-O-D-L, those guys who believe in that concept, they tend to play on different parts of the investment curve in crypto. They look at tokens, they look outside the box, sort of logic. Bitcoin has now become more of a traditional guys looking at, if I want to get into crypto, I'm going to look at Bitcoin. That, that's the mindset. So I think there will be a driver there. I think if we see something in the news right now is Apple talking about looking at payments in crypto. I think if Apple were to come in, for instance, I think if Elon would start tweeting, he loves Bitcoin all over again, and we get some regulation uh, that is constructive, this will be a massive, massive driver. Ethereum, on the other hand, I'm still bullish on Ethereum and how it looks constructively. I think that the way DeFi is growing, I think it's an amazing thing. I think there is the use cases, and I think Ethereum 2.0 will be key uh, when it's finally unlocked in terms of the ability to scale, lower gas fees. Uh, I mean, this is what drives these sorts of coins. An example that just happened was Matic, Polygon, right? Uh, what's the guy named the owner of the Dallas Mavericks? And he came out, Mark Cuban, he said he bought a bit of it. And suddenly it's flying through the roof because of that. That is the nature of crypto. And I think that is something to be aware of. It can hurt you if you're not careful, but it can also be very constructive if you think you are on the right track, track and investment trend, I think. Okay, well, there are some interesting questions. I think this one is more for Damien around China. Um, and how do you see the ongoing debate or, you know, uh, from China and to someone in the US, but, but obviously from China, that would cause the impact to the landscape and market of crypto? Uh, so the question is like... Uh, China well, regulators, China regulators, where do you see that impacting? I think that they will be a lot stricter than uh, they will be in the U.S. and EU, and I think they're they're just not very familiar with the the with Bitcoin overall, and they they have a need to control it overall. Uh, what I think this initial the the latest news is really more about just protecting the small term retail investors, uh, rather than them just saying a wholesale ban uh, and uh, for them to be a, have a mass sweep and like uh, stop Bitcoin in any shape or form uh, within the mainland itself. It's really more of like, hey, if you're a large investor or if you have the resources to be able to dabble in this, you know, feel free to do that. But don't try to engage the society as, as a whole. And for people who can't, you know, be, uh, can't take that risk and lose all their money. And, and for that to cause a, more of a societal, like a widespread, you know, uh, disappointment and like loss of money. So that's, I think the way China is going to go. Uh, having said that, I, st I still think that they're going to be a bit more restrictive for a while because what's coming out is uh, they are digital currency and they want to really like push, push out everything and all to allow for that to flourish as much as they can. Even like uh, within like the Tencent pay and Alipay has to be compliant with this new digital currency thing. And they don't know where like the, the future is going to be in it, but they just want to like uh, spread, like spread the sea and allow that to have the best chance of like succeeding overall. 
So that's not really a cryptocurrency because it's uh, it's still centrally controlled, but it's obviously built on uh, some blockchain technology overall. CJ, any further thoughts on China? I think China is interesting. I think that the problem with how crypto reacts to China is uh, everybody reads a headline and then they start panicking. Uh, we saw that uh, over the weekend. We saw it when they spoke about mining. And it's interesting, right? Because if then you start reading the fine print and what was actually discussed, and you realize they can be quite constructive. I mean, the mining issue seemed, and it, at first everyone was like, oh, they're just going to ban it outright. But then it comes out an issue of what energy sources are you using, right? And is it coal versus hydro? And is that coal is illegal? So I, I do think that they are cognizant of what needs to be done. Uh, I agree with Damien that they are going to do what's in the interest of protection, uh, call it protectionist of sorts. But I can't foresee an outright ban. Uh, the only way that would happen is if they really do perceive it as a threat to the digital RMB. That is where a lot of the central banks are going heading towards anyway in terms of digital currencies. So that will be an interesting dynamic. I think what will really move the market more will actually be US regulation when it comes to crypto right now. Mm. Because it, I think there was a recent uh, survey done and a lot of crypto users, uh, the US is one of the largest. And then after that, Germany is actually very, very large as well. So I think these are areas where to be cognizant of. And, and since we're on the topic of digital currencies, uh, what are both your thoughts on the potential rise of the digital currencies and the impact on crypto? I, well, well, this one's tough because we've not really seen like uh, what are the specific details on it. Uh, I think if anything, uh, it might actually affect a lot of the stable coins a lot uh, because the stable coins were built as intermediaries because when people were trading fiat to like a regular US dollars to, to Bitcoin, you know, the settlement was taking really long because of the US dollar piece. So people had like the, the stable coin uh, built uh, and as an innovation on the back of that. But if the regulations there and the digital currency is totally accepted, then we might actually see that that allows like the on-ramp, which is very narrow right now into crypto, widen a lot and it actually could have like a big rallying effect uh, on crypto on the back of that. So I think it might be slightly contrarian, but it actually would help crypto prices overall in that sense, if the regulatory environment like uh, is suitable at that time. Uh, I'm going to say I wish they could live in harmony, but uh, I'm, I'm more of the, I'm actually in agreement with what Damien thinks as well on this. I, I think that it can actually be constructive. Uh, I think what's most at risk will be your stable coins. So your USDTs, USDCs. Uh, having said that, I think the general thesis of something like Bitcoin, I think that will remain. Uh, okay, this is, a, this, is the, this is the flip side of that. Um, presumably, then your conclusion is if most governments were to ban crypto, uh, the lower usability of crypto would then affect the valuation uh, potentially crash the crypto market what do you think of what do you see would be that impact in that black swan everybody decides to ban crypto and you know what would be the impact of that crash in the traditional market like what well, what would be the follow-on impact i mean the question then becomes this though is will traditional markets lead crypto or crypto lead traditional markets i think coming from a traditional space one of the interesting things is over the last one year, it's not so much about crypto, it's about the concept of printing money. It's fiscal policy, right? And, and, and literally speaking, that has led to S&P highs, bond yields close to zero. And at, as a subset, people then look, what's the next investment they look at? Now, if there was an outright ban on crypto, let's say globally, the fact of the matter is crypto has two different markets. Yes, there will be a crash of sorts, but it does have two different types of investors. You really have the people who buy it because they believe in it. That is something that's really interesting that some markets just don't have. So yes, will it crash? Will it trade sideways, be boring? Yeah, maybe there's that chance. Will it go away because of something like that? Probably not, is where I look at it. Yeah, I'm gonna hazard another price uh, up there. And I don't think you'll go to zero because I agree with CJ in the sense that, that there are like uh, different like investors and participants in this network. Uh, what you'll see that I think is quite interesting is that uh, it's where there are some countries where the government isn't really trusted or like uh, the institutional like, like, uh, framework is not built out there. 
can see some government uh, where like people are underbanked and things like that. So a lot, and there's no way for these governments because they just don't have the technological capability to be able to uh, regulate it or like to even like force uh, enforce anything. So you'll start to see all these things flourish in like uh, the underdeveloped markets, especially those places that are underbanked. So yes, there will be a crash, but it won't go to zero because there'll be all these use cases where like uh, government framework is not very good overall. Uh, as CJ also kind of alluded to it as well, that if the, even if the developed world, you know, if they continue to print money and things like that, you know, and it's going to be hard, you know, finding out who owns a smart wallet and things, I mean, or, or just a regular wallet, you know, that it, it still could recover from that crash and like uh, continue to be a store of value if everybody thinks that's the only safe thing that uh, I can have. Because if you think about it, gold, like most of the gold is also still in like uh, in some warehouse in, in, in London overall. So it's still hold, held by uh, institutional people overall. And if people want to self custodize then, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, you, you can't force them to, to not do that. Yeah. Yeah. What was a really interesting fact to me was that the amount of gold that's been mined since the beginning of gold mining fits less than fits into less than three swimming pool sizes. So fascinating little trivia fact. Um, you know, we have a lot of questions about DeFi and I, I want to stay on that, that topic for a while. Um, do you, and, and I always think of DeFi a little bit as the dystopian parallel universe to traditional finance, right? Uh, so one of the questions is, do you think DeFi will, well, the question here was eat uh, traditional finance. I don't know it will eat, but where, where, do you, where do you think DeFi, will it actually take over um, traditional finance? I'll let Damien uh, start with that because he touched on it in his presentation as well. But I have my view, don't I? I'll, I'll say it for afterwards. Sure. Uh, I think it, it's going to make, in the developed world, it's going to have to, like, just as, like, uh, I mentioned the friend of me part, it's just going to have, like, the, the banks to think harder on, like, uh, different ways to make money. Uh, because DeFi, it's just there and it's, like, so clear. You can see the code. You can see exactly what it's doing. You can put in money whenever you want. You can take it out whenever you want. Uh, and you know, like uh, it's it's a risk regulatory wise, and it's also a, a, a boon for some people. You don't need to have to deal with the KYC aspect of it. So yes, you know, it's good and bad, you know, and I think both can have it there. Uh, going back to the emerging markets again and the developing markets, where there's just no banks or like they're 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 worried about like putting their assets in the banks this would be a great use case. And if everybody just has a smartphone, you know, they can access their funds immediately, pay for it immediately, not having to, to, to worry that their bank's gonna be closing down or like, you know, uh, the currency is gonna uh, start, they're gonna start printing money and like having hyperinflation overall. So uh, I, I think they can both live together. And I think there's like, uh, use cases, it will definitely grow and the banks will just start to have to think a, a, a lot harder on like what they need to do and can do. I mean, I'm going to touch on that point a bit more. And I think it's, it's the truth, right? Banks are resilient. That's, that's the underlying thing, right? Banks know how to adapt, survive. They, do, they can move fast as they want, but more importantly, they have the right stacks in place. They have legal teams, compliance tech. They, they know how to twist and turn, right? And I think that there is a place then to coexist for both. Right now, if you were to look at the market, most of DeFi is, is run by retail investors. And I think DeFi, while a brilliant concept in what it is, uh, that whole concept of a trustless without the middleman concept, uh, you are subject to human nature. You are subject to not everyone playing by the same set of rules in how they look at these things. I mean, there's a lot of talk out there. The biggest thing now in DeFi and, and setting up is DAOs, right? Decentralized autonomous organizations, which can run on themselves pure governance models uh, for these things. The issue that the people don't realize is that part of the governance in voting process literally is if I hold more tokens, I get stronger votes. So isn't that that concept of whales? Isn't that concept of majority? So I do think that that needs to be ironed out and before that DeFi can really reach the next level. So I do think that there is a place for both to, to live and coincide. And the fact is this, uh, humans, investors, traditional investors will never fully put their trust in something like DeFi. It's sometimes it's just good to have that concrete structure, uh, that person to reach out to, to call if something goes wrong. I think that will always persist and prevail. 
so so there is a question here around how do you think about or measure risk for the various categories of crypto and, and DeFi? Measuring risk from an investment perspective or from a... I assume so. Uh, well, you could say that uh, gung-ho versus the conservatism at the end of the day. Uh, I think it's this it's a broader question, right? That it's a broader question of how should you look at crypto investments? And I think that, as we alluded to in earlier questions, there is a place in a portfolio for them. The reason why is this, if you were to just take a step back and look at how can you invest in crypto in the first place, you have Delta One, outright spot, synthetics for your options, and you can also take advantage of nuances in the market, the carry trade, for instance, which Damien touched on, and the fact that, to give you an example, volatility is five to seven times higher than S&P or dollar yen vol, for instance. So there are ways to monetize it. Now, how do you rank what is safe and what's not? There is no clear cut formula, unfortunately. Uh, what's been happening in the DeFi space, for instance, a lot of rug pulls have been happening recently. Uh, it happened on a number, of, especially Binance Smart Chain, unfortunately, recently had a few. I think that's been a bit of an issue there. And fundamentally speaking, people from a risk adjusted return and how they can approach it, most likely they will look at Bitcoin as that first port of call. Once they get comfortable with that, what we normally observe, especially for our trading and the clients that we trade with, is they'll first start off by buying Bitcoin. After they've bought a Bitcoin, they're comfortable with that whole wallet transference progress. They then start looking and they unwind a bit of the Bitcoin. They say, okay, what about these altcoins? And they start doing that. And literally speaking, a couple of weeks later on, you talk to them and they say, yeah, I'm trying my hand at yield farming now in DeFi. So there is that progressive nature, which I think is beneficial. Uh, and I think that's how I would look at the risk aspect of it. Uh, look at the question from a different angle, I guess, overall is uh, how do I look at risk in, in this space overall? Uh, part of it is, and I guess some people are, the people who are joining the call would be more interested in given that, you know, these are slightly different from traditional finances, like, uh, especially for DeFi, since uh, everybody's talking about it is like the smart contract risks. I think that's the biggest part like uh, that's different from traditional finance and the, the part that people have to worry about the most. And uh, unless you're a very dedicated programmer and things like that to be able to, to pour through it or you've seen people or you, you, you have enough money to pay someone to audit the code to make sure that there's no bugs in it, uh, there's always that aspect of it where you know, something can go from a really great concept you know, to zero because of some hackers overall. Uh, so you have to start. So one easy way is to just to see how long it's, uh, it, it's been alive for and then just to get, to get on it after it's uh, proven itself for a couple of years. Uh, Bitcoin had to do that you know, because nobody be believed in this like distributed consensus and things like that. But once uh, everybody started to believe in it and that it couldn't be hacked, and you know, then like more and more people start to start to come onto it. Uh, so for decentralized finance, you can kind of wait for that, you know, wait for uh, uh, for it to be proven itself. You can also start to see uh, you can also start to see how you know like whether the people governing the the project, you know, if there are like some ways to try to mitigate the risk. Like something very interesting and innovative in this uh, space is that they offer bounties. So whenever there's like, uh, if people see something where there's a vulnerability, rather than you know like uh, incentivizing people to hack it, they actually pay so, like they reserve some of the coins and pay it to the people to to point out like a specific bug. So it incentivizes uh, the community to actually make it stronger rather than like to try to go through nefarious means to. to uh, to make money overall and things like that. So if you see some like aspects of this, like within the coin, uh, the people that are behind it, you know, whether whether it's just like some uh, nonsensical thing, you know, to, to to take advantage of hype, but there's actually a good use case behind it, then that's that's really how you should look at the risk, uh, you know, whether it's gonna be rug pulled, are the people anonymous and things like that. So uh, that's how I look at risk overall in this space. So, so we we currently have uh, you know more than sort of close to forty questions unanswered. So I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to finish everything. But we do uh, uh, have, we have uh, you know CJ and Damien staying with us about fifteen minutes more. So I'll try and cover as much as I can uh, across this. I think some of the more interesting topics uh, will be around Elon Musk volatility. 
you know, what do you think about that? Like, how is it that a single tweet from an Elon Musk can literally move the market? Or was that actually because it was Elon Musk and then it was China? You know, and, and do, you, do you see this volatility? Because, you know, it's, it's sort of quite a heart attack <laughs> inducing over the weekend, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, CJ? I think uh, volatility is, is technically crypto's middle name. Uh, it will be there. Uh, it's always been there, to be to be honest, right? Just as we saw that rapid crash, the fact of the matter is, if you look in how short a span of time crypto went from ten thousand to sixty thousand, it sort of tells you how fast this asset class moves. Uh, Elon Musk, yeah, he does a bunch of tweets, and it does affect the market, unfortunately. But it's not just in crypto. Well, when he tweets certain things about Tesla, it affects Tesla shares. Uh, the only problem, the only difference is when he does that, the SEC comes down on him. Uh, in crypto, unfortunately, there is no one to do that. I think he's not the only one, though. I, I think it's more like excitement and hype which causes it. We saw it when he tweeted Tesla will accept Bitcoin payments. And then we saw it when he went back on that as well. It would just flip the other way. So there will always be this element of volatility. And I think this construes well for what type of ethos should you take when you invest in something like crypto. Uh, volatility will always be there. Uh, unfortunately, bull bear market, it, it will be around in this space. And that is why options... That is why the vol levels are unprecedented compared to a lot of other asset classes out there. But the way to do it is if you try and day trade something, you probably will get a heart attack. Uh, I think D Damien put it in his investment, uh, how to look at it, right? I think buy and hold is an interesting concept. And I think that works, especially if you know what your timeline is like. But volatility will persist. Now, as to your question of the recent events, it does feel kind of like a perfect storm. Uh, it does feel like this announcement, then that announcement the next day, then that announcement the next day. Uh, it will happen and it will come from time to time again. But having said that, it could have gone the other way. You could have literally gotten four superstars to tweet one day after each other and it would have just rocketed the price the other way. So I'm going to say that it will perpetually be there. And it's just something to understand that if you invest in this, it is, especially if you do spot, it's almost like investing in a leveraged investment because how fast and how quick it can move, which is why that, how many percent I thought was a really good poll because that dictates how much risk you're willing to take. Uh, I think overall, like uh, it was really like uh, the initial one was like uh, definitely Elon Musk tweet and then the, the China thing didn't really help as well. Like the, the sentiment was quite fragile as well. And I think that like overall market wise, there was some rotation overall from like Bitcoin and the Ethereum. And uh, as, as, Bitcoin was coming off because of that rotation. I think it like triggered also some of the stop losses overall, and it just started a cascade overall on that. Um, and so yes, it all. But if you look at it, like I, I uh, back to this, what I was looking at for like uh, my presentation, uh, there's been like eighty percent like drop. So this is not really like a huge drop in terms of like uh, overall Bitcoin. And you have to keep in mind as an emergent technology that. Uh, as you said, you know, CJ, like volatility is going to be the middle name as, as everybody tries to figure out what's the pricing for it uh, overall. So, but uh, even then you can, even if you don't like Bitcoin or you think it's too volatile, uh, there's ways to profit on it. Like, uh, and that's where the derivatives come out. Like uh, the implied vol in Bitcoin is like 120%. And you can really participate in it without having to just like close your eyes and buy right now. If you're more comfortable, you know, buying it at 20,000 or 30,000, there is uh, like you can you can easily buy or sell a uh, sell a put there and uh, be be very happy when it goes back down there and like uh, slowly like uh, add it to your position there and things like that. Uh, shameless plug, obviously, for Bit.com and Matrix Corp. Thank you, guys. Um, there's obviously we spend a lot of to time talking about Bitcoin and and Ethereum. Uh, some there's, there's some questions around what well, the alts, uh, alt coins that you would look at. There's a question around what's the prospect for alts like Cardano and Polkadot. Um, what's the potential for Dogecoin? So we'd love to hear your views around those. I think uh, you can you can segregate it into two, right? You, you've got your layer ones, which is the underlying protocols, and you've got technically building on top of that. Uh, I won't comment on Dogecoin right now. It's, it's still the ultimate meme coin. Uh, everybody's still trying to figure out, figure out if Elon owns the bulk of it, which I don't think he does anyway. But I would say this. I, I, say, I would say that 
amongst the layer one protocols, uh, Damien mentioned, which was good, which is literally first to the market, right? And that's what Ethereum was. So it had that advantage. Having said that, uh, hot on its tails are projects like Polkadot, are projects like ADA. Uh, and I think this is interesting because I think it opens the playing field. And if you look at what's happening, for instance, in Polkadot, you have the parachain auctions happening in June, July, August, around this period upcoming, which is when it goes live. I think the most important thing when looking at these other chains, for instance, is to look at the ecosystem being built around them. Ecosystem extends to multiple things because some of the foundations behind them, they actually do come up with things like ecosystem funds, grants. And these chains are only as useful as the number of people who develop on these chains. So investment into this area actually is crucial. So we do see quite a bit of that. And we do see that across chains. So the, the question really speaking is who's going to be the last man standing? Well, technically they can all coexist. The question is at what level? Uh, I'm going to spend like 30 seconds talking about Dogecoin. Uh, Dogecoin is a bit like GameStop in a way, I find it. Uh, th there is no use case. And I think right now they're trying to find one for it. It is the ultimate meme coin. Uh, and I think just looking at where it stands, it does have its followers. This is the same concept as if you look at certain stocks out there, people buy it because the guy behind it is considered, I wouldn't say godlike, but I would say the respect that they have, almost like cult status. I think Dogecoin is there uh, to a very large extent. And the listings that it has, uh, it's quite impressive to be fair. Yeah, I think it's a winner takes all as uh, like uh, CJ mentioned, like, like uh, a very clear example now is like the Binance Smart Chain, right? Like so uh, gas prices are really high in Ethereum. And uh, so before Ethereum 2.0 comes out, uh, what happened was that Binance was able to attract a lot of like uh, of a community around it to build like use cases uh, around it, like pancake swaps and things like that. And also the gas fees were really low. You know, everybody's cognizant of the fact that you know it's really centralized because of Binance. But what what does that mean? It also means lower gas fees, and it also means for like faster transactions. You know, and like people. Uh, like people are gonna decide that hey, that's uh, I don't mind the centralization if it means you know like uh, cheaper transfers and like it's not necessarily everybody's gonna think the same way, and uh, the the user base is still so small for both of them that you know like even if you like if like uh, it doubles the base you know like both both sides can benefit at the same time and everything rally on the back of that yeah. So um, moving sort of a little bit you know, convergence between mainstream and, and, and crypto. I mean, do you think that uh, for someone who's obviously starting out and looking at this space, it's actually quite mind boggling, right? How do you get exposure? How do you, you know, cold wallet, hot wallet, what does that all that mean? Are there different ways of representing or ex expressing that? I mean, for example, Coinbase, right? Just got listed. I mean, whether you're not think what the valuation should or should not be, but obviously it's a legitimate exposure into uh, crypto in a, uh, a traditional way, sort of. Uh, do you see other exchanges like Kraken or all of that being a, an alternative um, and a sort of a, a, a safer structured way to be exposed to crypto in an indirect way? I, I would say, if you want to do crypto, do crypto. <laughs> that's, that's the most direct way I'd say it. Uh, the reason why is if you're willing to, and, and the, the mentality should be, don't invest in crypto anything more than you're not willing to lose. It's a simple concept, right? What can't go to zero. And the reason why is this, you do crypto because you're looking for that alpha on a portfolio diversification basis. You do it because the implied vols are multiples higher. You don't need to, if you have a private bank account, for instance, leverage up on a bond just to get additional yield. You can literally just buy spot and the way it moves is, is going to be there. I see a lot of people looking at that concept of investing via something like Coinbase, via the stocks, for instance. And I, I understand where they're coming from. from. It's comfort, right? I, I, as a stock, it's regulated, but it also opens up its can of worms in a more different dynamic because now you are not only subject to crypto risk, you are subject to that corporate risk and that credit curve, right? That credit curve basis of what does this balance sheet look like? What does the income statement look like? And will they still be around? Which is why I say that if, if your aim is to get exposure to crypto, there are smart ways to gain exposure in crypto. And this is what we tell our clients as well, uh, where we assist in what is the right trade for them to get this sort of exposure. And if you are going down that route, that is probably the better way to do it than to look at the stock side of things, I think. 
I think so. I think uh, I totally agree with CJ on that front in the sense that I think you should engage in crypto uh, by yourself. It also helps you to make an informed decision if you are actually down the road to say, hey, you know, I understand the underlying technology or I've at least participated in it. I've seen like the use cases and all what it can be do uh, can be done with it. I want to invest in Coinbase now. So if you don't like, it's a great way for you to uh, understand a company and understand uh, like what it's doing by actually like, uh, it's one of the very few things, for example, like oil mining that, or like uh, oil refineries, there's no way for you to be able to engage in oil refining by yourself. But this is the best thing in the sense that you know, anybody with, a, with a, a computer, you know, can look at it, you know, you don't need to invest a larger amount of money in it, you know, as, you, as uh, CJ said, you know, invest or, or like start really small and uh, play around with all the different things, you know, you might lose a little bit of money at the start, but there's nothing like just you know engaging in it uh, in terms of learning. Like that was my journey as well. I I don't say I, I'm not like a veteran in this, but like it really was like uh, just spending time, you know, actually engaging with some of these protocols and actually like looking at it, like looking at some of the deficiencies and the advantages in it by actually like using it is how you're gonna learn overall. Uh, not 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 from like reading Reddit like subreddits or like uh, looking at like some crazy YouTubes. Thanks, Damien. Um, okay, I think we have time for two more questions. There's one that caught my eye because it's super technical. So I'm just going to throw it at you. Uh, we have a crypto bull out there who says, I think it's all good to go. Do you see the layer two, three solutions affecting Ethereum in the mid to long term? Or do you think the EIP 1559 will help Ethereum? No, I just completely just read that off. So I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I mean, just, just a light one. I mean, EIP for those uninitiated, the one five five nine is actually the current proposal, uh, and it's really trying to change how Ethereum fees uh, are affected, fundamentally speaking, right? Uh, I think that at the end of the day, uh, this goes back to actually to another question that you, we answered earlier on. It is really that people can live in harmony. There can be multiple uh, protocols together. Everything will find its use case, and I think the next thing that a lot of people are looking out for is actually that concept of the interoperability bridges so between blockchains, between solutions. And I think that will be an interesting dynamic. So I don't think you're going to see a case of something going to zero versus something going 100%. I think they will find balance. And it's anybody's guess, though, which of the competitors come up uh, in form. But I do think that what we're seeing with Ethereum in the direction it's going is correct. It is necessary. And it is probably one of the biggest barriers to hurdle right uh, now, especially in something like DeFi is that gas fee that Damien was speaking about. Yeah, so I think it actually will help, uh, like, uh, but it's contrary, like a lot of the miners are like uh, complaining right now uh, because they will lose a lot of their, uh, their fee right now for mining. But if there's a lot more volume, they're gonna make a lot of money on that. And I think that's what they don't realize. Uh, so, so I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. Like one thing was like, when Bitcoin was selling off or like when a lot of the miners got shut down in China, uh, everybody wanted to move their money and like the actually and all the miners made uh, the, the leftover miners made a lot of money from like all the fee transfer. And even if like Bitcoin runs out and there's no more coins to run, uh, run out, if there's so many people using it, it, it still could be really lucrative, like a profitable being a miner just from like uh, collecting the fees from facilitating the transactions. Uh, other thing is also like the layer two solutions are going to help a lot. So a lot of people, this is something we didn't touch upon. Like a lot of people say Bitcoin, seven transactions a second, uh, whereas like Visa is like thousands, 1700, I think uh, a second. Uh, Bitcoin is not going not, to not gonna be able to replace that. That's true. But like same as like gold, you know, why do they have it in a centralized location in it? Uh, it's just easier and faster to trade futures. So you could have a wrap version of the BTC. Now have that on like some of like the other like uh, layer two solutions or layer one solutions where there's a really quick transfers, but like there's like a central repository where like uh, Bitcoin is the underlying like store of value, but you just trade the wrap versions, which are like, you can kind of think of it as the analogy of like the IOUs or the futures or, or whatnot. So there's all these innovations, uh, but it gets really technical uh, overall, but no, 
yes, I, I, I think uh, all these things will actually help it grow, not, not hinder it. So uh, I we have many questions left uh, to answer, but I encourage all of you, if you really want our, our speakers tonight to help answer some of these, uh, send them across to us, we'll, we'll help some thoughts together. So my last question for the both of you, it's a, it's a very open question, and I have some, obviously, uh, words to add to that at the end. How many years do you think before this becomes mainstream? And I deliberately keep it wide and open for the both of you. <laughs> I mean, so I'll, I'll finish off on my side first on that one, I think. I think the, the, the way I'll put it is, how is it not perceived as mainstream right now, especially for Bitcoin? Uh, you've got corporates buying in, financial institutions buying in, banks looking in the custody space, regulators now figuring out how do I tax this? Do I tax it at the transaction level? Do I tax it at the holdings level? Uh, there is acceptance. There is legitimacy behind it. I think mainstream in terms of how about using the underlying tech for something what the altcoins are built for, that's a bit tougher to envision, for instance. There are a lot of awesome protocols where the technical information, uh, innovation behind it is mind boggling. But the fact is using it in everyday life, it's something that that's the next layer for these things. So I, I, to, to me and to answer that, I think Bitcoin is considered as mainstream. That is why we talk about it so much. That is why we see it everywhere. That is why there's futures. Even the options market, interesting enough, I can give you an anecdote there. I think we were looking at December vaults for something like Bitcoin. And it's literally two and a half to three vaults wide in some points, which is almost comparable to what you see in equities. So it is there, it is traded, and there's more people there. So I think it's not a matter, it's not as long as you think uh, for others as well to follow suit. Uh, I'll try to answer it a little bit more straight down, like uh, strictly and like straight down the alley is, I think about six to seven years, uh, what I, uh, I think then that ties in with what I think in terms of like, uh, that would be enough runway in terms to get the regulatory like certainty that you, you will get from the US and China. That would be enough time for now for at least one of the digital currencies to come out to see how they would play nicely between the two of them. And lastly, I, I also think that would be enough time for enough handheld devices to be uh, powerful enough to be able to engage with some of these smart contracts and like uh, to and DeFi and all these other protocols to, to have developed and matured enough where it, people are comfortable you know, using their handhelds to, to engage with them. Thank you, gentlemen. My, uh, my closing observation here around going mainstream, I mean, part of the reason why we're having this webinar is actually the, the amount of reverse inquiries that we're getting around you know, expression of, of investment in that. And I said, at the moment, it's very mind boggling, right? The options that are available to you, how do you do it, et cetera. And I think where, where I'd like to uh, see us is maybe have a couple of interesting uh, um, mainstream like products that you know have exposure to crypto in some shape or form. It could be in the form of a fund, uh, you know, it could be in the form of some kind of a tracker cert, uh, somewhat sort of regulated, but the underlying is crypto, so that investors are comfortable with with that, right? And I think increasingly you will you will see that convergence happen. You know, very, very. I mean, I can. I just see the the DeFi world converging so rapidly into into traditional finance. I think it's just a matter of time. I think for us, it's really just to find the opportunity to allow our investors uh, to get some exposure uh, in some shape or form in the right way. Anyway, um, I thank you uh, so much. I know we've uh, taken a lot of uh, people's dinner time, uh, but I love the conversation. I hope we can do part two with the two of you quite soon. Maybe this is when Bitcoin uh, does hit 100,000. Uh, but thank That'll you. Be a happy discussion. Yeah, yeah, that would be a very happy discussion indeed. And for everyone, you know, please feel free to write to, to Alex, uh, Alexander, dot, uh, Alexander Lee at addicts.co for any further questions or if you want to find out more about uh, either Matrix Sport, GSR, or Addicts, uh, please reach out. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.